Welcome to another edition of the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite. Today we continue on in our series on the origins of life with the topic of variation. I'm going to say before we even get going that a lot of today is going to be review, but I need you to make the deep connection between the necessity of genetic variation as the raw material for evolution. So let's go ahead and look, our, look at our objectives and get going. By the end of this video, two things I need you to be able to do. First of all, discuss the importance of genetic variation to evolution, so that'd be that uh, deep connection I was looking for you to make, and compare and contrast various sources, various sources of genetic information or variation. Man, words are hard. Compare and contrast various sources of genetic variation. So that's what I need you to know. Let's just go ahead and jump right on in. So first thing, kind of an interesting point. When Darwin wrote On the Origin of Species, published 1855 or so, I believe, he proposed this idea of traits being heritable, being passed down from one generation to the next. When he made that proposal, though, Mendel had not yet published his work. So there was no idea or concept of genes or anything like that. Um, the laws of inheritance hadn't been worked out. So it's kind of interesting to note that Darwin proposed this idea of traits being heritable, but he had no idea how they might be passed from one generation to the next. Hint for any test you ever see. Oftentimes they try to throw you tricky questions and talk, ask something about Darwin's um, theory of evolution, including something about genes, that is always the incorrect answer. Darwin, when he put his theory of uh, descent with modification out, he had no idea of genes or genetic material. So, you know, just recognize that Darwin knew nothing of that, so he would not have added that in his theory. He just simply said, whatever this trait is that is helping an animal survive can be passed down to future generations. And the next thing I want to make clear before we get going is that natural selection works on phenotype, but only genotype is passed along. So phenotype obviously is the thing that is seen in the environment, but genotype is the gene for that trait. So it's funny, I got a picture of Arnold Schwarzenegger on the side there. He's got the genes, like just normal genes to produce muscle, but through bodybuilding, he was able to build his muscle up to ridiculous size. Those big muscles can't be passed along to his kids, all right? That's not, like, that's a phenotype that he worked to build up, but it's not inheritable. So only phenotype traits that are directly, I guess, coded for by a gene can be passed along to the kids. All right, last thing before we get into sources of variation. We've got this idea of average heterozygosity big word, and it's the raw material for evolution. So we've talked a lot about genetics, and for any trait, you can be homozygous dominant, homozygous recessive, or heterozygous. When it comes to evolution, being heterozygous is the best raw material for evolution because you can, you've got one of the dominant traits and one of the recessive traits. If you are homozygous dominant or recessive, evolution can't really act a whole lot on that because you are going to, well, I mean, you're just going to pass along the same dominant trait or the same recessive trait. I guess if you were to think about it, um, natural selection could take one of those traits altogether out of the population, so take away the dominant trait or the recessive trait. But as far as evolution is concerned, it's best to have heterozygous individuals because they've got one of each trait, so the best one of those two traits can be selected for. And the more heterozygosity there is in a population, the more likely it is to show some evolution over time. And we've got this idea of geographic variation, which essentially says that if you are going across a geographic area, you are very likely to see um, variation in both the genotype and the phenotype of the animals. And this is represented along a cline. A cline is just like a transect across a geographic area, and it expresses how the animals change over that area. So if you think of Dolphins, as you move from the Caribbean on up towards the North Atlantic, you are going to see multiple different kinds of dolphins. Each one is going to be a slightly different species or variation. I mean, they're all still dolphins, but as you move along, you're going to see different sorts of traits being expressed over that um, area or region. Also, you see this frequently on islands. Let's say you've got an island that is split in half by a set of mountains or something. You might have the same basic species of animal on both sides of the mountains, but each population is going to show a little bit of difference in its genetic makeup or its phenotypic makeup or both. So recognize the decline is just a change in a population over distance or over a geographic area. 
All right, let's go ahead and just quickly bounce through a couple of sources of, uh, I guess, variation. And this should all be reviewed. Just recognize that these sources of variation are the raw material that natural selection uses to cause evolution in a population. So the first one, formation of new alleles. We've talked about this. This is DNA level mutation. So we are talking about point mutations, frame shift mutations, things like that. And as I talk about mutations through this, again, remember that most mutations are detrimental or they don't cause any change at all. But every now and then you do get one that can be beneficial for survival. So first source of variation is just formation of new alleles through DNA level mutations. Second one is changing the number of genes. An example on this, um, we've talked about genes being duplicated as a form of genetic level or uh, gene level mutation. Remember you can have duplication, insertion, deletion, inversion. Um, with regard to duplication, it's been shown over time that the most primitive ancestors of uh, mammals likely had one gene that coded for the sense of smell. Over time, that gene has been duplicated such that humans have got a thousand genes for our sense of smell. Mice have got 1,300 genes for their, so their sense of smell, forgive me. So if you've got a gene for something like smell, it might not necessarily be a bad thing if that gene is duplicated over and over again. Also, if you've got genes being duplicated, that offers raw material for evolution because if you've got two copies of the gene, one gene might uh, code for the normal trait and mutations can collect in the other copy and maybe over time you'll get a beneficial mutation. Next up on the list is rapid reproduction. Now, note that there's a roughly general rate of mutation. Scientists have been able to calculate that roughly one mutation happens per 100,000 genes per generation. All right, so that's not, I mean, that's not a lot at all. 100,000 genes, one mutation in one generation is, that's the general rate of mutation for most living organisms. Now, obviously, populations that reproduce more quickly are going to show a higher rate of mutation because I think about a human, you get a generation every, 10 or 12, 15 years, something like that. Elephants, it's even longer than that. I think it's like 20 or 30 years, but bacteria, they can flip over a generation every couple hours. So if you're a quick reproducing organism like a bacteria, you're gonna show a much higher level of mutation because you're gonna go through generations much more quickly than an organism that does not reproduce nearly as quickly. So rapid reproduction can provide the mutations that can be the raw material for evolution. And finally, this is it, we're almost done. Um, when it comes to evolution, probably the best source of variation is sexual reproduction, all right? We've talked about crossing over, that's where mom and dad's homologous chromosomes flip some genes back and forth and you get the nice novel combination that is you. We also talked about independent assortment, which is the random chance that half of a homologous chromosome will go to you go to one cell and half will go to the other cell and then we talked about fertilization all that stuff put together i think we calculated was something like one in a 70 million or billion chance that you are you the numbers are really high so just think back to all that stuff we talked about with meiosis and genetics and all that that is the richest source of variation that the natural world can work on in i guess favor of natural selection or making natural selection happen so that's it that was quick. Um, I hope that was helpful. Just remember, make that connection between all the stuff we've talked about with genetic variation. Take that genetic variation and realize that that is the raw material that natural selection works on to cause evolution in a population. Remember, evolution happens in a population, not an organism. Um, causes evolution in a population over time. Thanks for joining us on the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite. We'll see you again.